Representative Edward Markey of Massachusetts. Good morning. Today, the Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance addresses some of the significant issues raised in the often stormy debate about the proper structure of the financial services industry in our nation. At the vortex of that debate are questions relating to whether Congress should permit increased securities powers for banks. I would like to begin by welcoming two very distinguished and busy gentlemen, both new chairmen of two of our most important public institutions, Alan Greenspan, chairman of the Federal Reserve Board, and David Ruder, chairman of the Securities and Exchange Commission. I understand that Mr. Greenspan is testifying before Congress today for the first time in his capacity as chairman of the Federal Reserve Board. We were, of course, privileged to have Chairman Greenspan in his private capacity uh, testify before the subcommittee earlier this session, and it is a privilege to have you testify in any capacity before our subcommittee, Mr. Chairman, uh, on issues uh, early this year relating to tender offer reform. We are pleased to uh, have you with us here today. And uh, we want to take this opportunity to congratulate you on your new position. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I know I speak on behalf of all of the members of the subcommittee when I say that we look forward to working with you. We are also pleased to have Chairman Reuter uh, of the SEC. It is a pleasure to see you again, Mr. Chairman, as well. Uh, Mr. Reuter has already testified before us in his current capacity, but we welcome the opportunity to hear for the first time his views on the matters that are before us today. We welcome both of you and thank you for taking the time to join us. The debate about the proper structure and role of the financial services industry is not new. Almost since the very passage of the Banking Act of 1933 and its Glass-Steagall restrictions, commercial banks have argued that they or their subsidiaries and affiliates should be able to conduct securities activities. What is new is the global scale of the debate the breadth and international implications of the questions raised and the arguments advanced, as well as the international stage on which the issues are being played out. If it ever was, this debate is no longer mere intellectual wrangling. It is rather a critical and timely debate whose arguments take the form of real-world actions such as rulings by the Federal Reserve Board and the Comptroller of the Currency. It is a debate that has real consequences right now and that has the power to bring about a major and abiding reconfiguration of the U.S. capital markets and enhanced international competitiveness in the future. Change of that sort, even positive change, may be tremendously disruptive with significant and far-reaching consequences. For these reasons, we enter this debate with great caution and we intend to evaluate the issues and arguments on all sides with immense care. But why even enter the fray? Why take on such divisive and complex issues? The short answer is that Congress must be at the center of formulating financial policy for this nation. In this decade, the drama about the future of our financial industry has been unfolding in the courts and the regulatory agencies. We in Congress have been on the sidelines while the Glass-Steagall wall separating commercial from investment banking has taken repeated blows and is threatening to crumble. Yet for better or worse, Congress erected the wall, and it should be Congress alone that restructures it if such change is needed. We want to ensure that our financial institutions remain competitive, both domestically and internationally. We should not allow our position of preeminence as the center of the financial world to be undermined. Yet we need your assistance in understanding the true extent of and underlying reasons for banks' apparent and growing lack of global competitiveness. It is, a product of regula is it a product of regulatory disparities? Is it a product of unalterable cultural differences? Is it a combination of the two? We do not enter this debate with any preconceived notion about its outcome. We will listen to the arguments on all sides, weigh their relative merits, and proceed according to our best judgment. We should remember in our consideration of these issues that deregulation in the financial services context, particularly with respect to diversification of products offered by banks, is not, support, is not synonymous with a lack of supervision. Indeed, we should not countenance deregulation in this area without vigorous supervision 
and the imposition of appropriate structural solutions to the risk posed. We come to these discussions armed with a healthy inquisitiveness. These are some of the questions we start with, though we anticipate that others will arise as we proceed. First, uh, and, and we see this as a key threshold question, have circumstances changed since 1933 such that the dangers perceived by Congress at that time no longer exist, or alternatively, do new equally effective responses to those dangers now exist? Second, will a more fully deregulated system with increased and vigorous supervision rather than out and out prohibition better serve our nation's economic interests? Third, can we effectively insulate deposits from securities activities, preserve public confidence in our financial institutions, and preserve the safety and soundness of those institutions if the Glass-Steagall wall is lowered or abandoned? Fourth, can we make such changes without wreaking competitive havoc on the banking and securities industry? And finally, can we ensure that conflicts of interest and other abuses are not allowed to proliferate? Until we receive satisfactory answers to those and other questions, we will forbear from drawing any conclusions about the continued vitality of and need for a Glass-Steagall solution to the problems posed by the intersection of commercial and investment banking. That concludes the opening statement of the chair. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Taki, for an opening statement. Mr. Chairman, I have no opening statement, but I want to join you in welcoming our witnesses this morning, and we look forward to their testimony. Great. Any other members seeking recognition for the purpose of making an opening statement? The chair recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's perfunctory, as you know, in these hearings to congratulate the chair for holding the hearing, but my praise this time is even more sincere than usual. I think that we really have three new chairmen, you being the third, and I appreciate your willingness to hold hearings on what I consider to be a topic of absolutely vital national economic importance. In the past, uh, the Government Operations Committee on the House side has probably been more active on this issue than any other committee in the House. And while that's a fine committee, and I in no way wish to disparage that committee, the Government Operations Committee has no legislative jurisdiction. So to me, it's very, very appropriate that we are taking up these fundamental issues. I've had some difficulty explaining to constituents and others in the political world exactly why these issues are so important. And I'd like to uh, take a run at an analogy here and, and see if it fits. To me, there are really three layers of financial structure. The first, and the most superficially appealing, is catching the crooks. And to make the analogy to a financial house, to me, that's looking at a structure with no major structural defects, but with a potential for uh, abuse of the structure. For example, if you leave a door unlocked or a window open, a burglar can get in. We've had problems with uh, catching some of these crooks in, in the last several months. But there's another layer that I think is even more important, and that's when the structure has some small defects in it, such as when the roof leaks, something like that. And that, in my opinion, is the level of importance of, uh, say, a tender offer reform measures that this committee is, is considering. But to me, there's still a more fundamental level, a basic level, that has to do with the structure of the building itself, to see whether that structure is sound, to see whether it can withstand earthquake, fire, wind damage, all sorts of threats from the outside that may be facing it. And to me, that's what we're facing here when we look at Glass-Steagall question, to see whether our financial house is not only in order and safe and secure, but whether it is structurally sound. I have some doubts on that question. The Glass-Steagall law was a very fine law when it was first started. I worry, though, that today that we might be unnecessarily beholden to concepts that, whatever their validity in the 1930s, have, have outlived that validity. So I appreciate your holding these hearings today. I look forward to hearing the, the expert testimony from the witnesses, and I would urge you to hold continuing hearings on this subject in the future, because whatever its lack of public appeal, I think once the public begins to understand the trillions of dollars involved and the threat to the American competitiveness in this area, that the public will not only be interested, but enthralled at the, the importance of the topic. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Washington, Mr. Swift. I ask unanimous consent to submit a prepared text uh, for the opening Without statement. objection, it will be included in the record. In Briefly, Mr. Chairman, I've been disturbed by a couple of trends that have been rather obvious in the last few years. 
the twin trends of increased administrative willingness to assert fundamental policy-making authority that should belong to the Congress. And the other trend is Congress's apparent reluctance to deal with issues that are highly technical, very complex, and esoteric. The two trends, of course, reinforce each other and lead to policy, very fundamental policy in the country being made in inappropriate areas. Over the past three Congresses, we've seen a number of attempts to redefine financial powers that have been coming from the Federal Reserve, the courts, to a lesser extent, the SEC. Um, and it is time, I think, for Congress to assert itself. I think it's also true that we have seen this battle going on for the last few years is kind of a test of wills, with certain financial institutions pushing a congressional initiative and other institutions <coughs> opposing it. I'm beginning to sense that there may be a certain amount of battle fatigue, and therefore it may be time for a reasonable compromise to be reached and energies uh, spent uh, on more productive things than simply fighting each other over the issue. We shall see. Again, I think that, uh, that there is a twin concern usurpation of fundamental policy-making authority by administrative agencies that is almost encouraged by Congress's apparent inability to act. Uh, I would like to preach restraint to the administration and, some, uh, and encourage us to, uh, to take some action on the contrary so that we can get fundamental policy-making back where it should be, I thank the Chair and yield back my time. Thank the uh, uh, gentleman. Uh, no other member is seeking uh, recognition for the purpose of making um, an opening statement. We now turn to our first uh, witness, Alan Greenspan, Chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve uh, System. We uh, thank you very much again, Mr. Greenspan, for your appearance. And whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Cool. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I plan to excerpt parts of my written text and request that the full text be included as part of the record. Without uh, objection, that uh, will be so ordered. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, I welcome this opportunity to appear before the Subcommittee on Telecommunications and Finance to explore the structure of the financial services industry with an emphasis on the regulatory framework that applies to banking and securities activities. I wanted to express my appreciation to you for calling this hearing and focusing the attention of the Congress and this committee on the important issue of the basic rules that should apply to the financial services industries. Before turning to the questions of financial structure, I believe it is important to reflect on our starting point. We have the strongest, most competitive, and innovative capital market in the world. Our job is to preserve its strengths and make improvements to assure its role in a substantially more competitive world marketplace. Banking is a vital part of this capital market structure, and despite a difficult economic environment, this industry has shown extraordinary resilience and strength. It has carried a special burden in the transition to less inflationary economic climate as some of the major sectors it has financed. Agriculture, <coughs> developing countries, energy, and real estate have been seriously and adversely affected by the transition, experiencing in some cases not only a relative slowdown in the rate of inflation, but actual sharp declines in prices. The banking industry is coming through this experience wiser and stronger. Securities markets also are adjusting to substantial change. The global marketplace involving 24-hour trading in a variety of securities is now a reality. There has been an explosion in complex new products and services, posing new risks and putting a new emphasis on capital adequacy. And here at home, attention has focused on a deterioration in ethical standards and the possible need to take corrective action. All of these concerns have led to a new and searching focus on how our financial structure can be improved. Mr. Chairman, your San Francisco speech pointed to many of these issues, including international competition, new securitized products, deregulation of interest rates, and non-banking organization expansion into fields traditionally thought of as banking services and vice versa. 
All of these developments have amounted to a very much more competitive environment for banking, while at the same time, banking has been frozen within a regulatory <coughs> structure fashioned some 50 years ago. Among all these changes, there is one development that I believe is of particular importance and is now a permanent feature of the financial environment. This is the erosion of the role of banks as intermediaries in the credit granting process as a result of major developments in data processing and telecommunications technology. These changes have taken the form of improvements in productivity permitting the efficient processing of large volumes of transactions, the linking of geographically separate markets, and a substantial reduction of costs. These, in turn, have had a marked impact on the traditional role of banks, intermediation, whose function it is to substitute bank credit for the credit of the ultimate borrower. Now, extensive online databases, powerful computation capacity, and telecommunications facilities provide credit and market information almost instantaneously, allowing the lender to make its own analysis of creditworthiness and to, to develop and execute complex trading strategy, strategies to hedge against risk. The result is that the basic products provided by banks, credit evaluation and diversification of risk, are less competitive than they were 10 years ago. These fundamental changes will have a permanent effect on the competitiveness of depository institutions and will expand the competitive advantage of the market for securitized assets. As one important example of the consequences of these changes, we have seen a remarkable expansion of the commercial paper market as a substitute for direct short-term lending by banks to the most creditworthy borrowers. Since 1980, this market has more than doubled, rising from $31 billion at the end of that year to $78 billion at mid-year 1987. The same kind of securitization of many other types of lending has proceeded a pace involving everything from home mortgages to automobile loans. As you know, banks have not been able to participate fully in servicing this extension of their own natural markets because of regulatory restrictions. The same technological forces are now prevalent throughout the world. To remain viable in this highly competitive and innovative environment, financial institutions are seeking to have the broadest range of products available to meet the changing needs of their customers. Thus, we have seen investment firms provide traditional banking services, such as short-term bridge financing, and banking firms, including American and Japanese banks that are under regulatory constraints at home, participate broadly in securities markets overseas. Mr. Chairman, you have suggested the fundamental test for determining the kind and scope of the required changes is what we will need to do is to serve better our nation's economic interest. You point out that in the process of considering removal of some or all of the barriers separating banking and securities firms, we have to ask ourselves a number of important questions, including A, how can we insulate insured deposits from securities activities? B, how can we ensure the continued safety and soundness of and public confidence in banking and securities markets? And C, how can we prevent conflicts of interest and concentration of resources? To these important considerations, I would add the corollary that our basic objective must be to promote a system which provi provides efficient services to customers, large and small, in an environment that promotes competition. As part of this analysis, I would add two other points that are of particular importance to the Federal Reserve, but are also of vital concern to the economy as a whole. A, we must have a system in which monetary policy can function efficiently, and B, maintains the integrity of the nation's payment system. There is, I believe, wide agreement 
on these goals. We accept as basic to our thinking that any combination of banking and other firms should take place within an organizational structure which separates the bank in such a manner as to assure that only the bank has the benefit of the support, support of the federal safety net, which includes deposit insurance and access to Federal Reserve lending. We also agree that attention must be given to the whole range of relationships between a bank and its affiliated entities to assure that confidence in banks is not compromised and that conflicts of interest are avoided. In addition, we are addressing such issues as A, the need for limitations on loans by a bank to affiliated enterprises or to customers of affiliated enterprises, B, the need for adequate separation of directors, officers, and premises, C, restrictions on the flow of confidential information, D, the scope of permissi permissible joint marketing, E, rules on intercorporate provision of services, and F, the need for public disclosure of affiliate relationships. We expect to have specific recommendations on how best to achieve bank affiliate insulation on the maintenance of safety and soundness, on preservation of conflicts of interest, and on avoidance of conferring competitive benefits that are unavailable to all competitors that are similarly situated. We hope that these rec recommendations will be valuable to the Congress as it proceeds with its consideration of the restructuring of our financial system and that our recommendations will enable the American financial system to remain competitive, serving the needs of customers here and abroad without compromising the strength or stability of our financial markets. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very, very much for your very thoughtful uh, testimony. We now uh, turn to uh, the question and answer uh, period, and the Chair recognizes itself for an opening uh, round of uh, questions. Um, let me begin again by just trying to put this um, in, the, in the larger context, just so we can understand the way in which this debate should be framed, and you can help us to do that. Uh, in your prepared testimony, you indicated that the traditional role of banks as intermediaries in the credit granting process has been eroded by major developments in data processing and telecommunications technology. As a result of these advances, lenders can deal directly with borrowers without banks as intermediaries. At the same time, lenders have the computerized capacity to undertake their own analysis of credit worthiness and to hedge against the degree of risk inherent in any loan. Banks are basically on the sidelines in this process. My question, and I will ask it in its most brutal form, is why should we care? If the capital transfer process has become more efficient without any loss, of, without uh, uh, a loss of safety, should we care that banks no longer play an intermediary role? And let me just spin that thinking out on that question just a little bit. I am not totally unconcerned about the competitiveness of banks vis-a-vis -vis the securities industry. But that lack of competitiveness, if it indeed exists, is certainly not what impelled me to hold this series of hearings. My concern goes much deeper than that. My concern is that 50-year-old laws are preventing banks from engaging in businesses and offering services that will make not them more competitive, but that will improve our economy and make us more competitive as a nation. Can banks, if subject to less product line regulation, assist our manufacturing sector by facilitating cheaper and easier export financing? Can banks safely and profitably serve as investors in the currently lagging manufacturing sector of our economy as they do in Japan? How can a relaxation of product line regulations on banks help our trade deficit, our budget deficit, our employment picture? I do not think that bigger is necessarily better, and therefore believe that it would be ill-advised to relax Glass-Steagall restrictions solely so that we can breed U.S. banks to match the size of, our, of the large Japanese banks. What it comes down to, in my view, is that our witnesses in this hearing should not be telling us what we should be doing for banks, 
Rather, they should be telling us how less product line regulation uh, can help improve our citizens' standard of living and our nation's economy, both from domestic and international perspectives. What I would ask you, Mr. Chairman, is that the perspective that we ought to have on this issue? And if it's not, could you help us to refine uh, the question which we should be asking so that we can keep it squarely in front of us uh, in the course of our deliberations? No, I would essentially agree with you, Mr. Chairman. But let me just start by saying, should we care if banks uh, basically contract? From a strictly economist's point of view, uh, if the intermediation process which banks have been according the economy uh, since their origination several hundred years ago no longer serves a useful purpose if we can obtain precisely the same economic functions by other more efficient means then one would have to argue that banks per se or depository institutions per se uh, are no, of no, no particular economic value to the system. However, what we have in our banking system in general and very specifically in its in a lot of different variations and I would add in here the thrift institutions as well is an extraordinarily gifted group of people who synergistically understand the financial process and the financial system in a way that would, would be very difficult to reproduce in another form. So while we might in one sense say that a decline in bank intermediation and the dissolving of banking institutions has no immediate, direct, visible economic effect, the breaking up of this type of knowledge base, this institutional culture, is I think uh, detrimental to the economy. And as a consequence, uh, if it is feasible to hold these banking institutions uh, in place and to function in a manner which assists in the financing of the economy uh, of, um, of Americans both here and abroad, then I think that's a very important value to preserve. However, I would also share with you, Mr. Chairman, your concern that we endeavor to merely compete in the international markets because they're out there. I have observed both from a position in the banking system and without uh, the interface of American commercial banking and investment banking, both, in, both here and abroad, and it is not particularly evident to me that size per se is where the competitive edge is. In fact, as I envisage it, the most competitive American banking institutions, indeed the most competitive banking institutions generally in the world markets are not the largest. Size per se is not evidently something which is particularly useful but skill, technique, capital is. Right. Well, let, can I just follow up on, this, on the state of our banking industry so that we can get your sense of the cause of some of their concern? Because some observers take a more, let's say, cynical view of the reason why banks want to get into this uh, business. And I recognize that there are changes in the financial environment that have caused an erosion of much of the bank's traditional business. And I also accept that many of these changes are permanent. But how much, and help us to understand this as we begin the process, how much of the banking industry's current problems, troubles, are the products of poor loan judgment on their own part? Bad luck in terms of lending to those sectors of the economy that have been hardest hit economically and mismanagement of uh, various sorts. In other words, first, how much is really the bank's own fault? And second, how much is really a fairly short-term situation that will uh, be self-correcting? Uh, 
Mr. Chairman, 2020 hindsight is something which economists like myself would love to acquire. Uh, the banking business, by its nature, is risk-taking. Show me a bank which doesn't take any risks, and I will show you a bank which has no economic purpose. As a consequence, you need to evaluate uh, the context of bad loans uh, from the point of view that they will always be bad loans. I frankly don't know whether or not uh, a good deal of the poor lending, which in retrospect is obviously the case, uh, is the responsibility of poor bank loan procedures or bad luck. I would say, as a guess, most of it's the latter. Uh, even the best banking institutions that I'm aware of, those with the most skilled loan officers, those with the most extraordinary techniques to preserve the safety and soundness of the institution, have been visited, as many have been, with bad loans abroad, bad loans in the oil patch, bad agricultural loans. So uh, what I can say for certain is that uh, I know of a number of individual instances of which I am familiar uh, in which one would have to conclude that one cannot question the uh, basic abilities of the people who were engaging in these practices. Uh, that is not to say that there are many others who were irresponsible, guilty of mismanagement, and a variety of other things. But I would be inclined to say that is far more the uh, that is probably a very minor aspect of this problem. But uh, what we really need to do, do is to go into the psychology and analytical procedures of loan officers and bank management in retrospect, and that, I think, is a very difficult thing to do. My own guess is that uh, uh, we will get through all of this, that uh, these are temporary situations, and that bank management in the United States, as best I can judge, is really first rate. So you're of the opinion that banks will regain their Oh, yes. Footing. No, I have no question about that. Can they regain their footing and create a solid environment for themselves working within the guidelines of Glass-Steagall? I mean, are, in other, what are, are there additional reasons why we should enter into this <coughs> minefield that is loaded with conflicts of interest and potential uh, difficulties that, uh, that uh, were, were, were identified when the law was put on the books um, that uh, go beyond, you know, shoring up the banking industry. Can you just give a, sh a shorthand uh, summary yeah, of the I reasons why, we should, why, we, why it's worth our risk to get yeah, into? First of all, let me just say in, in preface, preface that uh, we at the Federal Reserve are examining this issue at this particular stage and have not drawn a specific conclusion. Uh, I would say that uh, it, we should not in any way consider any changes contemplated as shoring up the banking industry. If that is what we're doing, mm -hmm. we're probably making a mistake. Okay. I wouldn't view it. I would view it more in terms of the way you originally put okay. the standards of determination. Okay. I thank you. Uh, my time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Taki. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, welcome, uh, Chairman Greenspan. It's uh, good to have you here. Thank you. I uh, enjoyed uh, listening to your testimony, uh, and it seemed to me that you made a fairly good case for making some changes in the uh, current structure. But let me approach it a little different way. Uh, suppose Congress does nothing. Uh, suppose, in the, or perhaps instead says, we want to... Uh, uh, patch the wall that was erected by the Glass-Steagall Act. What is the impact of that kind of policy on the economy of the nation generally, on the banking uh, industry uh, more specifically, and uh, what are the implications for the average uh, American? Well, Congressman, you're raising precisely the questions that we at the, at the board are raising to ourselves. And uh, I would hesitate at this stage to give you uh, even preliminary answers because what we are dealing with here is something really quite fundamental. 
We've had regulation of this particular type in place for a half century. We've gotten used to it. We've structured our institutions around it. We've looked for ways to get over walls, break down walls, do a number of things. And one has to be very careful when one evaluates changes of fundamental institutional structure that has prevailed for more than a generation or two, because you don't really fully understand how the system is adjusted to those regulations. And before you unwind them, it's important to understand that you have to unwind the regulations in a manner which does not undercut the economy. So I would say at this stage that uh, uh, we don't yet fully understand precisely all of the implications of moving in the direction of uh, a uh, change of great significance uh, or even elimination of Glass-Steagall. We're getting there, and at some point, I think we will be able to present to the Congress our best judgments on all of those very important questions. Maybe I better back up a step then. My uh, reading of your testimony suggested that you were, suggested to me that you were urging us to act, uh, that in fact you were suggesting that we should uh, expand the uh, uh, bank securities powers. Uh, am I? Am I reaching the wrong conclusion? No, I'm, I'm, I'm the, we at the Federal Reserve have expressed a number of, of uh, concerns about the, uh, the problems that we are discussing today and have, in a sense, uh, initiated an expansion of a number of powers. What we're talking about today is a very fundamental shift. Uh, I must say to you that uh, my professional inclinations move in the direction, as I've stated, for reasons I've stated in, in, my, in my actual text. But let me just tell you very specifically where the real problem in my own judgment lies. If, for example, we did not have uh, the federal safety net, that is deposit insurance, access to the discount window, the access to the payment system, then I would say there is no rational reason to have something which is, in a sense, a, a wall between uh, securities, investment banking type powers, and commercial banking type powers. The one issue that we have to be certain that we can in fact, in, in effect, to effect, is that the uh, essential federal quasi-federal subsidies, which are built into the deposit insurance, which enables commercial banking institutions to borrow effectively with a government guarantee, as well as the other safety net uh, characteristics. What we want to be certain is that subsidy, which serves a very fundamental public purpose, is not employed for other than commercial banking. So for those of us who are inclined in the direction, as I am, in tearing down this wall, we also have to be in a position to stipulate that, in effect, by so doing, we are not, in effect, allowing uh, the investment banking powers which would accrue to be financed by federal guarantees. So. You are concerned in substantial part about the problem of unfair competition, a federal subsidy that would be essentially used by the banks to compete unfairly. I guess that is a little different from what I have. No, can I just to sub yes. substitute? The answer is yes, but I have a more fundamental issue. Okay, please continue. The, the same views that lead me to like to see a freer economy are those views which also makes me very much disinclined to extend federal subsidies. And what I don't want to see happen is that the subsidy structure underlying the federal safety net not be extended beyond what the Congress very specifically constructed it for. Okay. I guess my concern has been, and, uh, and what I've tended to focus on, is uh, the issue of the stability of the banking system. 
that if you allow the banking system to expand into areas that are not protected uh, uh, through the deposit insurance uh, uh, system or are not in, and are less uh, inherently less stable, that then you might uh, destabilize to some extent uh, the banking industry in the country and raise new concerns among uh, average consumers. Uh, is that a concern that uh, is real uh, in your view, or is it uh, something that uh, we should not uh, focus our attention on? Well, I'm not inclined to say there are areas which one should, by definition, uh, not focus on. It's usually those well, which I come back and hit well you in the founded. face. Is it a well-founded? Yeah. I don't, uh, I'm, um, I'm not inclined to be concerned terribly much about that issue. I mean, I understand that it could be a problem. It doesn't bother me that much. You must tell me why. I mean, maybe I should back up a little bit. I, my understanding is that's essentially why we had the separation in the first place. Oh, was sure. Because of concern about the stability of the banking system. Why is that not a valid uh, reason for maintaining the separation today? Well, first of all, I think we have to go back if you read the history uh, that led up to the Glass-Steagall Act, some of the uh, activities that went on in today's context are really nothing short of horrendous. I mean, uh, some of the things that people did in those days is something which uh, securities people banking people would look at with absolutely unbelievable uh, amazement. Uh, we have had a number of laws, specifically in the securities area, which I think has essentially eliminated the vast proportion of them. Uh, we have a lot of remaining problems, as Chairman Ruder, I'm sure, will, will address. But things have changed really quite considerably. Secondly, let's also remember that uh, investment banking per se need not be a terribly uh, unstable or high risk business. It really depends on what you do. I mean, there's a lot of investment banking operations, for example, uh, which uh, basically have assets mark to market every night and short-term financed in a manner which uh, is uh, fairly appropriate. And uh, in many instances, a number of, uh, not the larger ones, a lot of the smaller institutions are actually hedged overnight, meaning that they go from the close of business one day to the open of business another day with very little risk. So, I mean, it's not... Uh, there's not, it's not that there's something fundamentally inherent in securities powers. There's no question that if abused like anything, it can be very risky. So it's really a question of how it is done, if it is done, what the form of regulations are, and basically how one prevents the types of problems which one considers could arise uh, from, from occurring. My time is up, Mr. Chairman, but let me just follow and ask you, when is it that you might be able to give your recommendations to us on this issue? You indicated that's yeah. being uh, looked I, at now. It's, it's underway now. I, I would say several weeks, but yeah. uh, we're, we're moving. It's a very, it's a, the more you look at this, the more complex it gets. That's what I'm concerned about. Thank you. Okay, the gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and welcome Span. I was kind of disappointed in your testimony, to be very honest with you. I didn't really find anything in there that gave me any indication where you all were going. So let me see if I can get you to be a little bit more specific. I'd like to know what kind of a structure you'd recommend. Uh, you're saying that uh, you believe that the, the bank should be able to get into some expanded services. What kind of a structure would you envision? Well, uh, Congressman, if you found that uh my testimony was vague and not to the point. Uh, I regret that I was trying to do something close to that. <laughs> and so you the reason, accomplished what you wanted I to do. Think I think I, well, you told me well, I, I had. You. I appreciate you telling me that I succeeded. Mm -hmm. And the, let me tell you the reason why. Uh, first of all, uh, 
if you asked my personal views, I would be able to give them to you on all of the questions we've been getting up here. I'm not speaking for myself. I'm speaking with the Board of Governors. And when we come up with a proposal, uh, I want to make certain that it is theirs, not mine. And as a consequence of that, un until we have had full discussions, and we are, in fact, discussing these issues, there's a remarkable degree of uh, uh, unanimity on lots of issues, uh, probably less so on others. Um, but uh, I don't think it would be appropriate for me until we've gotten um, some fairly firm uh, views down to c come up here and give you opinions which we subsequently would have to retract. Now, this is not a new issue. I mean, I can't imagine that you all at the Reserve have not thought about this for some length of time. And as your statement says, you know, you expect Congress to be very active in this area. There hasn't been anything preliminarily decided over the years of, that, I, that we should be aware of, is there? You mean by the board? Yes. Not to my knowledge, no. Well, let me ask you this. Can you comment today about whether or not the structure that you would recommend and the, the services that you would recommend, whether or not those uh, services should be under the jurisdiction? Let's take security, for example. Should that be under the jurisdiction for enforcement by uh, the reserve, or should it be done by uh, the SEC? Well, that's, uh, that's actually one of the issues which uh, uh, we're looking at. I mean, as I understand, the uh, Chairman Reuter is, in fact, making recommendations of cer certain types of functional regulations in the securities, certain securities areas, brokerage area. Uh, we're looking at that, and we will have a response to that uh, as such. I mean, we don't have anything uh, uh, preordained about whether we should be going to functional or other forms of regulation. I mean, I think th they both serve very useful, uh, all various different structures serve useful purposes, but you have to define what it is you're trying to do before you decide how you do it, and that's what we're, we're trying to do. Well, I appreciate those comments, and as a member that, you know, believes that we should be active in this area, as Jim Cooper said, your recommendations on what kind of structure we should have and who should be involved in that structure, but more importantly, who should enforce of these measures, and those recommendations from you would be very helpful as we move down this legislative process. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to congratulate our distinguished witness because already after a short time on the job, I think he is as hard to pin down as Paul Volcker was. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where you take lessons in Delphic utterances, but I think you passed the course. <laughs> what I'm trying to decide right now is whether this period of indecision is your way of turning back the clock or whether you're waiting to get your feet on the ground. And I'm going to ask you some specific questions to see whether the Fed is willing to stand by some of its past decisions, some decisions in the very recent past. For example, the August decision to allow blind brokerage systems. Is that still the Fed position? Yes, it still is the Fed's position. How about the April decision to allow certain large money center banks to underwrite commercial paper, mortgage-backed securities, municipal revenue bonds, and securities backed by consumer installment debt? I have no, I know, I must say, of no changes uh, or no second guessing on any recent uh, rulings by the Board of Governors. So all past decisions still stand during this period of so review? Far. Uh, none of my colleagues have indicated otherwise, and I therefore presume that to be the case. Well, how about the philosophy of your predecessor? He was last on record before Congress, I believe, specifically endorsing the granting of four different bank powers, underwriting revenue bonds, commercial paper, mortgage-backed securities, and allowing banks to get into mutual funds. Is that a statement that the Fed still stands by? Well. I would say philosophically, I would suspect, yes. But I think we're now getting into a much broader question, which really occurs as a consequence of the, the moratorium uh, 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 ending, I think it's March 1st, and uh, 
the endeavor on the part of the Congress to relook at the whole structure in a broader way. So what I would suggest here is that, uh, what I would indicate here is that uh, of necessity, the, the Board of Governors has had to look at much wider issues than individual rulings uh, merely to uh, be try in our endeavor to try to be helpful to the Congress in addressing the issue uh, uh, which uh, you are in the process of uh, in endeavoring to resolve. So uh, I would say that on the one hand, the general philosophy that the board has uh, enunciated in recent months is, I think, uh, one which is still there, but I think the specifics uh, are really getting to much broader issues. Uh, Mr. Swift stated uh, uh, before he had to leave uh, that he thought that uh, the Congress was abdicating its uh, responsibilities in this area and that the regulatory uh, agencies were in effect doing too much. Well, in a sense, I agree with him. I think that it is the, uh, the bailiwick of the Congress to construct legislation so that we have guidance on what it is we are doing. And now that the Congress seems to be desirous of doing precisely that, uh, our focus has moved into this area and we're now thinking in terms of the broader principles that are implicit uh, in the type of legislation which the Congress now seems on the edge of considering. I still think it's important to find out the degree of continuity, if any, in Fed policy. It's my understanding that you're the only new member of the Federal Board, Federal Reserve Board, since many of these decisions were taken. So if anyone has, uh, is a new factor, it is you. <laughs> and yet you're using the others to have a wait and see attitude. Well, let, let, me, be, let, me, let me be very specific, Congressman. Mm -hmm. If you are asking me are there any of the recent rulings of the Federal Reserve Board which I hold, which I uh, feel strongly uh, is a mistake? The answer is no. Thank you for that specificity. I appreciate that. How long do you think it will take the Federal Reserve to look at some of these broader questions and then come back to Congress with specific recommendations? It takes Congress a long time to act, as you sure, know. No, I understand that. No, I. Th uh, it's, uh, I hate to put a date on it because we're in the process of considering it. It's, it's weeks, not months. So you think the committee should invite you back at that time when the period of review is completed to find out the... Uh, if, if it's in the committee's interest, mm -hmm. certainly. Mm -hmm. If, uh, let me jump ahead here to some of the deeper issues. If it does turn out to be possible to insulate subsidiaries of banks or bank holding companies from all these evil effects. Would you be in favor of substantial modification, if not repeal, of Glass-Steagall? Is insulation, in your mind, the paramount question? Yeah, I would say it's the paramount, but not the only question. There are a number of other collateral issues uh, which are involved. Uh, let, let me just say, say this. Um, uh, in recent weeks, and I think uh, largely as a consequence of the uh, interest of the chairman of the Senate Banking Committee, Mr. Proxmire, uh, a number of people have all of a sudden begun to review the whole Glass-Steagall history and the potential of changes there in a way which I don't think anybody really seriously looked at previously. And needless to say, uh, oh, we too are doing the same thing. Uh, I would say that the condition of insulation in one form or another is a necessary, in my view, but not a sufficient condition. That there are other smaller issues, but you're certainly correct. I would say that is unquestionably the most important question, but not the sole question involved. How would you rank some of the smaller questions involved other than the insulation question? I'd hate to do that at this stage. 
It seems to me that an undercurrent in a lot of the statements we've heard today is that this is all a one-way street. Banks are wanting to invade the territory of securities firms. And to me, it's a two-way street. And a lot of the invasions have already occurred in the other direction, namely securities firms invading the traditional territory of banks. That is often characterized when it is admitted as a market development or an inevitable consequence of an advance in technology, mm -hmm. when in fact it can also be explained somewhat more parochially <laughs> as just an outright invasion of another person's turf. Would you agree that this is very much a two-way street that we're looking at when we're resolving these difficulties? I, I would certainly hope so, Congressman. It struck me in particular that some of the questions, <coughs> in fact, the three key questions that our chairman put forth for consideration are questions that can also be asked of the securities industry. For example, how can we insulate insured deposits from securities activities? That works both ways. How can we ensure the continued safety and soundness of and public confidence in banking and securities markets? Works both ways. And the third, how can we prevent conflicts of interest and concentration of resources? That certainly above all works both ways because the Chinese wall is just as um, interesting a barrier as the Glass-Steagall wall. <laughs> would you agree, and this would be my last question, the time allotted, um, that if Congress fails to decide, if Congress continues to delay, that there is no way that the marketplace will stop moving and developing, and that we cannot say here in the Congress something like, stop the world, I want to get off, or stop the world, give me more time to make up my mind, that a moratorium, even when legally in place, does not stop the marketplace from moving. And our failure to decide would, in fact, be a decision in this case. Yes, I think it would, Congressman. What it would do is because you're getting a considerable continued pressure coming from the marketplace, that inevitably forces pressures on the regulatory agencies, ourselves included, and we are forced to try to interpret what the Congress would have done if it had done it. And I think that's not a particularly useful set of guidelines for us. I cannot say to you that uh, there's any desire on the part of the Federal Reserve to extend our regulatory reach. What we are are creatures of federal legislation in this area, and we seek guidance. And the more guidance that we get, the better off we are. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The gentleman's time has expired. Uh, we'll go uh, for an additional round of questions. The chair recognizes itself once again. And I'd like to bore in, if I, if I can, Mr. Greenspan, on a uh, question which was raised by uh, Mr. Taki, and that is that the Glass-Steagall Act was uh, enacted after very careful consideration and, what, and after much intensive uh, investigation and represented at least in part a response to abuses that were believed to have caused a host of bank failures during the Depression era. How can we ensure that those sorts of failures will not occur again? Your predecessor, Mr. Volcker, used to say facetiously, we've gone 40 years without a bank crisis, let's make sure, let's, let's make some enormous third world loans. Uh, how can we make sh certain that uh, if we were to permit an expansion of banking activities, that uh, those activities would neither foster uh, nor exacerbate conditions which uh, could lead to um, substantial financial problems for the banking industry. Well, Mr. Chairman, let me just take a step back for a minute. Um, you have to distinguish between the abuses which occurred, and there were extraordinary abuses which occurred in the late 20s, uh, and the evidence that these, in turn, were instrumental in significant bank failures. There has been, in the recent literature, as I recall, a number of analyses which suggest that the tie is by no means clear. And in fact, in the vast majority of instances, uh, the types of institutions which failed had nothing whatever to do with uh, securities issues. I think, to a large extent, the, uh, the Glass-Steagall Act was a response uh, to abuses which n did not in and of themselves create huge numbers of bank failures. That was caused by other things. 
I think that what you want to do is to be uh, certain that uh, whatever, to whatever extent changes are made, and I think some changes are going to have to be made because the markets are in fact forcing that, but whatever extent changes are made that uh, we try to understand as best we can uh, uh, what caused the problems of the 20s and the 30s and whether they would exist in any new environment constructed under the resurrection partially or fully uh, of the types of institution which existed before Glass-Steagall. We are in the process right now of examining those questions and clearly part of the concern that we have is the, is the changes that are happening in the world regardless of what Congress has done in recent years. You expressed some uh, satisfaction uh, at the fa with the fact that there will be an expiration of the banking expansion moratorium next March. I certainly hope so. What are the dangers lurking in your mind if that moratorium is extended? I think what you, what you do is you lock in the status quo in a regulatory sense when market forces are changing fairly rapidly for, uh, for reasons over which we have very little control. Uh, what you do is you create inefficiencies, you cr create quasi-monopolies, you create concentration of certain, in certain areas which are undesirable. And in a sense, you create a non-competitive environment precisely the opposite of what the intention of the Congress would be. Right. Well, let me ask the flip side of the coin. Uh, what are the consequences if the moratorium is not extended? Will there be a race to the regulator, a race to the courthouse in order to uh, further uh, break through in new areas uh, of, uh, of uh, bank powers? I would suspect there could very well be. I don't know that for a fact, but I wouldn't certainly rule that out. In what areas do you think that the banks are most likely to begin their, uh, their uh, new incursions into well, the... I hope that, that I hope that is a wholly hypothetical question, Mr. Chairman, because if the Congress uh, proceeds with legislation, any such discussions I, I think I'm will saying be eliminated. The March first deadline is one which looms legislatively mm -hmm. uh, on the horizon, and uh, because of that, we would have to have some sense of the urgency with which it would be necessary for us to act, and if there are no impending substantial negative consequences in terms of extending the deadline. That is, that if we did not extend it um, uh, and uh, the banks were out but not substantially engaging in new types of activities, then it would give Congress more time to deliberate. So we'd have to get some yeah. sense of what new activities uh, were being considered. Well, I, I'm, I'm not in a position to answer that question in any useful manner because uh, uh, it's hard to know what will develop over the next number of months, what new products, what new ideas, what new uh, 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 legal insights certain uh, uh, banking institutions might or might not have. Uh, the one thing I would say with a reasonable degree of assurance is that it is highly risky to keep that uh, uh, moratorium in place beyond March 1st. Okay. Um, commercial bankers and other opponents of the Glass-Steagall Act argue that the securities industry is oligopolized. Do you agree with uh, that assessment made by opponents of Glass-Steagall? I don't think so. You do not think so. How would you characterize the existing Well, I'd say that the industry? best way of determining uh, whether true oligopolies exist is whether f freedom of entry is available. And uh, I know of no industry in which uh, it is easier to get into if you have adequate capital and have uh, uh, capabilities as in this industry. There are so many little boutiques around, so to speak, which are very efficient, very effective, and very profitable. Do we need more 
entrance into the market in order to ensure that there are uh, competitively uh, priced services. Uh, I'm sorry, we're talking now about banking and the, or and the investment the banking. banking area. Investment banking. Do we need um, in, 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 in the securities area? Do we need m new entrants, or does that already exist in terms of a uh, sufficient uh, cross section of pressures that ensure that there is well, I, competition know, and yeah. consumer benefits? That it's not actual new entrants that you need; it's the possibility of new entrants. Meaning by that. Should there be, let me give you a very specific point. Supposing somebody devises a specific type of exotic product in the investment banking business whose basic purpose is to try to find a certain type of risk hedge which is not available. In the early stages of the introduction of that product, the originator is likely to do exceptionally well and make very large profits. But unless he has some extraordinary advantage, he is going to get competitors very quickly, whether they be de novo, meaning individuals coming in who are not in the business previously, or people who are currently in the business. That will immediately eliminate any so-called monopoly or oligopolistic profits. But that does not exist, you're saying. There is no monopoly or oligopoly. Not to right my now. knowledge. So what I'm, I guess what I'm saying is that the, the argument that you need more competition does not necessarily, in terms of just ensuring that there is a competitively priced services for customers is not, um, is not an existing problem. There are other reasons to do it, but that is not necessarily one That's of That's correct. I, I must say to you, Mr. Chairman, there are other questions. I mean, the people who raise this issue about oligopolistic prices uh, or oligopolistic profits are raising an interesting question as to why there has been a uh, fairly significant concentration of certain type of investment banking functions amongst the very few firms. Uh, that's not caused by the uh, inability of firms to enter into the business. It's caused by the fact that uh, boards of directors tend, when seeking investment banking advice in many a areas, try to get those firms with substantial historical reputations. And as a consequence of that, until reputations are expanded amongst a number of the smaller firms, it is difficult to get into certain types of businesses. But I would not consider that oligopolistic in the sense that there are actions taken by these firms to inhibit entry. It just turns out that they've managed over the years to build up exceptional reputations with the public. And that's a franchise which we should encourage, not try to destroy. Okay. Well, let me look, can we look at it from the, again, from the flip side, which is that is there a potential that allowing investment banks to get into this area could lead to a decrease in competition? That is, that the city banks of the world will, um, uh, that is, if we allow the commercial banks in, rather, I'm sorry, if we allow the commercial banks in, that will allow for a decrease in competitions as the city banks begin to buy up our largest securities firms, and you wind up with the law of unintended consequences taking hold, which is that rather than, ironically, more competition, you have less as the larger institutions begin to swallow up these other comparatively smaller firms. Yeah, you know, it's an interesting question you raise, Mr. Chairman, because free enterprise economists like myself tend, I hope, to try to always argue precisely that question. Will that happen? I mean, forget our theories, you know, that it's, it's not supposed to happen in theory, but can it happen? And I think it's incumbent upon all of us, especially those who are strong deregulators like myself, to be especially sensitive to that type of question, and I hope we will be. It, it is possible, then? Uh, the is word it possible, yeah, the, do you mean possible? It is, possible likely. That, it is possible that could happen. Well, it's possible. I don't, uh, my impression is it's not likely. Okay. Um, is the, 
uh, I guess, is the, uh, the history that we've seen in the uh, interstate banking area where the larger banks are moving in and taking over smaller and smaller, uh, taking over more and more small banks. I'm sorry, you're talking about intrastate? Interstate. Interstate. Interstate banking. Is that, a, um, is that a trend that gives us some insight into the likelihood of them moving into this uh, commercial banking area and taking over uh, already existing uh, security uh, firms? I don't know the answer to that, but I will tell you that uh, if the presumption is that uh, small investment firms or small commercial banks have a absolute disadvantage in all respects against larger institutions, I think the facts are against that. Uh, what we have learned in the commercial banking area is that uh, uh, when larger uh, commercial banks, for example, endeavor to move their branches into uh, uh, areas where smaller banks are functioning, okay. uh, that they don't necessarily do very well. Okay. Uh, investment banks, uh, smaller ones, which we all often call boutique type operations, in the, specialist, in the specialized areas where they try to concentrate their resources are often much better than large investment banks. So I'm not, uh, uh, so long as free capital is free to move, so long as investment is free to move, it is very difficult, if not impossible, to create either monopolistic or oligopolistic positions in the securities or in the commercial banking area. Can I, I'd like to ask you just a couple of quick questions and then my time will expire. Uh, you've expressed uh, concerns about the level of corporate debt existing in the United States today. Your predecessor, Paul Volcker, expressed similar concerns. Uh, when you walk through a bookstore today, it seems as though there are as many economic gloom and doom books on the shelves as there are diet books. <laughs> and there are uh, any number of uh, economic observers who are predicting some impending financial catastrophe. Mm -hmm. uh, many of those books discuss the enormous levels of debt on the balance sheets of United States corporations. Uh, if there comes a time when, in your view, corporate debt is reaching alarming levels, uh, a view already held by some, what actions are available to the Fed uh, that you may use in order to inhibit the growth of corporate debt? There are certainly no simple tools. I mean, the type of tools that the Federal Reserve has were it, were we desirous of curbing that. Uh, the tools that we have available clearly don't come to that issue. And were we to use the tools that we do have available, we probably would create, as you point out, unintended consequences, which would be worse than the debt problems themselves. I might say that the debt problem has not been worsening recently. It's gotten, in fact, if anything, slightly less worse. Mm -hmm. um, yesterday uh, on uh, the David Brinkley Show, you made some interesting observations regarding uh, interest rates, recessionary environments, and the Fed's monetary policy. And I particularly noted your response to a question that sought to get you to predict, to predict the timing of the next recession. You stated that no one has repealed the business cycle mm -hmm. and that we could have recessions in our economic future, but the current economic indicators were not signaling one. My question to you, Mr. Chairman, is if we do experience the onset of a recession in the next few years, how will America's corporations weather the storm? Uh, when you testified before this subcommittee in April, you express significant concern about the level of corporate debt, much of it brought on by hostile takeovers and leveraged buyouts. At that time, you stated, quote, as a consequence of mergers and acquisitions, leveraged buyouts, and corporate stock repurchase programs, the net liquidation of financial corporate equities has approximated $230 billion since the beginning of 1980. Interest payments as a percent as, uh, as a percent of non-financial gross operating income currently are running at approximately 31%. Unquote. Mm -hmm. In a reception, that sounds like a, uh, a prescription for uh, corporate disaster. 
um, is the debt structure going to cause our corporate uh, sector and as a result our economy as a whole greater headaches during the next recession? Well, I would say by almost uh, inevitably that uh, to the extent that debt burdens rise and fixed costs as a percent of gross operating cash incomes rise, then there is less flexibility to take uh, a significant recession. I think we have to distinguish between uh, uh, a recession and a severe recession, because clearly the order of magnitude here is very crucial to how one comes out. Uh, Can I ask just interjecting there, could the existing levels of corporate debt help to turn a recession into a severe recession because of their inability to withstand the I, shocks? I don't think we're quite at that level, but uh, I am concerned about the overall level of debt, not that it could have significant impacts on the economy overall. I'm more concerned about what it would do to the individual companies and the corporations unless they uh, get a better balance of debt equity. We're not quite there yet, but are we approximating that point? I would say that, uh, the entity, exactly, we're not there yet. Uh, a few more years of the type of debt accumulation that we had seen, or more importantly, which is really the crucial question, the change in debt equity ratios. That's the real basic question. And where are we in terms of that? Well, the problem here is, and it's, it's a tough one to evaluate, because if you do it on a book value basis, then debt equity ratios have risen quite significantly. The trouble is that when you mark the balance sheets to market, this very sharp increase in stock prices has flattened out the uh, the rise in debt equity ratios, and if anything, has uh, made them look uh, a good deal better. So uh, it's a hard call in the sense that uh, uh, whether one should be looking at book or market values. If you were looking strictly at the market values, you probably would not at this stage be terribly concerned. Uh, but the book values certainly give you a different picture. So you are very concerned in looking at the... Uh, I would. I am concerned, but not to the point where uh, I think we're on the edge of some significant problem. This is a this is a problem I think for this country over the longer run. Not certainly not this year, next, maybe not for five years, but it certainly is a type of problem that unless uh, we find a means of handling, I think will make. Uh, uh, adjustments uh, in the business sector are somewhat more difficult. But there are certain individual corporations in this country that you'd have to be concerned with yeah. in terms of the amount of corporate yes. debt that they've assumed and their ability then to withstand. Uh, Without question. Okay, thank you. Time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oklahoma. Mr. Steiner. Thank you, Ed. Uh, just a couple of things. Uh, let me see if I can summarize what you've tried to tell us today. First of all, you've told us that you would defer to Congress on the policy questions. You also have told us that the overriding factor should be uh, the benefit to the economy and not to shore up any institutions, any decisions we make. You've told us that you think we need to find the right structure to put in place in order that we might do a good job enforcing and also to regulate that structure. Finally, you've told us this morning that failure to decide on these issues are unacceptable, basically. Let me go back to the second thing you've told us this morning. But the overriding factor should be a, the benefit to the economy and not to shore up any institutions such as banks. You've said an oligopoly concentration within security shouldn't bother us. You, should, you have said that the free flow of capital should be the overriding factor. What, how do you define benefit to the economy? I define it very specifically as benefit to the consumer because Ultimately, it's consumers and through business back to consumers where the ultimate value choices in this economy is made. If consumers put a high value on a certain type of financial service, 
then that the providers of that service will make money and they will do it. <coughs> and if consumers are not particularly interested in a certain type of service, it will disappear. And so ultimately what we should be endeavoring to do is to try to consider what is it that is the most benefit to consumers of financial services in this country and as a collateral issue, the structure of the financial in, uh, institutions on the economy as a whole. What, what services are be, being denied consumers today that other people around the world have that we don't have? I'm not sure that uh, I could give you a list at this specific, uh, th at this specific point. Uh, we have an awful lot of, of products uh, that are out there. The crucial question is not what's available in the rest of the world, but any products which consumers might want, which they are unable to get. Can you give us an example of no, that? No, I don't. As a matter of fact, I think at the moment, uh, one of the issues that we're confronting is the fact that uh, uh, we have <coughs> accomplished a good deal of commercial banking deregulation, uh, spe especially in the uh, acts uh, passed by the Congress uh, earlier in this decade. And as a consequence, we're creating an awful lot of new types of products all the time, some of which are not profitable and pulled away, which is another way of saying the consumer didn't want it. I mean, I have a, I have a, uh, an, a general view that uh, we shouldn't be listing all of the various things that we should be constructing as powers for our depository institution. That presupposes we know what consumers will want. I'm more inclined to give generic powers in which you are, in a sense, saying to the depository institution, provided you adhere to regulations A, B, C, and D, that you can produce, in a generic way, products which you think might be valuable and profitable, and let the purveyors of new financial products decide not either the Congress or regulators. We don't have that capability. And in fact, if we stipulate a long list of products which we say are desirable and should be uh, embodied in legislation, I will guarantee in five years from now that legislation will be obsolete. OK, let me go to my final question. You said that it would be highly risky to continue the moratorium beyond the date of next spring. Now, would you still say that if Congress fails to act and does not regulate in any sense in this area? Well, what I mean by risky, I mean by the fact that I think that the moratorium at the moment is not something I would uh, subscribe to as desirable. The longer you keep it on, the longer you freeze the system, the more distortions that are going to build up behind it. I'm not saying that on March the 2nd, if you don't if you extend the, the moratorium, you know, some catastrophic calamity is going to occur. Of course it's not. But I think it, it is the type of risk which has no real benefit on the other side. In other words, if it was a, a risk for which you got a real significant trade-off and you weren't willing to take the risk, that's fine. But I see no practical use of extending the moratorium when, in effect, what it tends to do is merely create further distortions, which is likely to make it even more difficult for the Congress to enact rational legislation. That, that's a good answer. It wasn't the answer to the question I had. The question is, is there a higher risk with or without regulation on that day? Uh, I would say there is. Uh, I mean, if, if the Congress did nothing, mm -hmm. yeah, I, would, I would say there is less risk in removing the moratorium. Less risk than in keeping it on, ideally, would be to, to have the Congress enact new legislation. Thank you. When this time has expired, I recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Greenspan, um, I don't want to be picky, but it seemed to me that in your answer to the oligopoly question, 
he relied on the economic definition of oligopoly, which is perhaps more technical than most people uh, who are listening to this might realize. Mm -hmm. And I think that, as uh, my colleague Mr. Sonar's question implied, we often intermingle the two terms. Less risk than in keeping it on, ideally, would be to, to have the Congress enact new legislation. Thank you. When this time has expired, I recognize the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Greenspan, um, I don't want to be picky, but it seemed to me that in your answer to the oligopoly question, you relied on the economic definition of oligopoly, which is perhaps more technical than most people uh, who are listening to this might realize. Mm -hmm. And I think that, as uh, my colleague Mr. Sonar's question implied, we often intermingle the two terms, um, the term oligopoly with the term market concentration. So to the extent possible, uh, I think it would be good if you gave perhaps a, a broader definition to the word when you're speaking to a general audience. Because when I hear people use the term oligopoly, they often mean to me rule by the few or market concentration. They are not giving much thought to barriers to entry or other fairly technical elements of the definition. I think you would agree, wouldn't you, that the securities market in New York is characterized by some market concentration? Well, let's take a step back. The reason we care about market concentration is because it somehow creates some form of inefficiency, imperfection, some problems in the marketplace which ultimately redound uh, to the distress of consumers. You can have concentration without that. And what I'm saying is that concentration per se is not uh, something which one should endeavor to fend off provided it does not affect uh, what consumers want. Some concentration is created essentially because consumers basically insist upon it. I mean, I can give you numbers of instances, but I don't want to name company names for fear of uh, uh, being their advertising executive. But uh, what the problem basically, we w what, what, what it is we wish to avoid is types of oligopoly types of concentration which are caused by the fact of uh, imperfections in the marketplace and inability for competition to function. You can have competition functioning in an oligopolistic setting. And what I'm saying is that is the condition of our securities markets in certain areas. But in the broader area, it is very difficult to say that our securities industries are oligopolistic. We have so many firms. The competition is so fierce. I don't know what the term, I don't know what useful thing we do by saying that there is concentration there. It, it certainly is not something which is inhibiting our ultimate purpose, namely to help consumers in financial services. I would agree with you that concentration is not per se harmful to consumers, but I was just trying to clarify of what I think many members do in confusing the two terms. No, I, I would agree with, sir. I certainly agree with your, your original statement. Chairman Volcker had a strong sentiment that regardless of how we choose to functionally regulate particular aspects of the financial services industry, that one agency or one regulator should have the big picture view, should be able to look at the entire entity instead of the pieces of the entity that might be involved in particular activities. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that it's important to have one agency oversight of the entire firm so that it couldn't hide activities in different subsidiaries? Um, you're aware that is a disputed view. There are those who would prefer just to do functional and to not look at the total entity. Well, but Chairman Volcker, as I understood it. No, no, I'm, no I, I don't deny that. I'm, what I'm saying to you is uh, uh, I haven't really given that issue enough thought to give you a thoughtful, thoughtful answer. I'd like to ask. Uh, your staff to provide us with some information if that would be possible. First, on my earlier question about it being a two-way street, uh, it seems to me that it's difficult for us to get it in our minds exactly how much of a two-way street it is unless we have a list, for example, of ways that banks are reaching into what was traditionally considered a securities area 
and ways in which securities firms perhaps already have reached into the traditional banking area. Would it be possible for the Fed to put together a, a list of that type? We will certainly try. Also, on the question of securities activities by U.S. banks in foreign markets, the extent to which U.S. banks are participating in those markets, and the relative record so far. It's a fairly new field, but it's a growing one, as well, I understand it's, it's it. Not, it's not all that new. They've been in that business for many years. Uh, by record, you mean uh, There haven't been any big failures, scandals, uh, you know, just well, a we, general we, overview sure. of those activities. To me, that would be very helpful. We'll, we'll provide that for you, Mr. Cooper. That would be very kind. An area we haven't touched on at all so far, dealing with large dollar electronic payments mechanism problems, not that there are any necessarily problems today because it's functioned marvelously well in uh, handling, what, a trillion dollar load virtually every day. But do you feel that the Fed has been given sufficient statutory authority now to protect that mechanism from uh, a foreseeable or unforeseeable threat? For example, the recent Banking Act gave you the power to even require divestiture of a non-bank bank should there be an unreasonable intraday overdraft. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that that payment system is so vital and so hidden to most Americans, we all take it for granted, that one of the primary responsibilities of the Fed, if not the primary responsibility, is to have a fail-safe mechanism that is not subject to uh, real disruption. Yeah. This may come as a surprise to you, Mr. Cooper, but I spend an inordinate amount of time on precisely that subject. It is terribly important. And uh, I've spent a good deal of time uh, uh, look, trying to learn precisely how the total system is working, what forms of technical backup we have, what various different mechanisms we have, which essentially are fail-safe mechanisms. Uh, the problem that you've got in this area is that the volumes continue to mount. The size of this problem is just staggering. Uh, I don't think there's an issue of authority. I think there's an issue of technology and there's an issue of uh, application. But I will tell you that uh, uh, some of our uh, reserve banks out there are really extraordinarily uh, uh, adept at working at these issues, and uh, well, as far as I'm concerned, uh, we at the board have got to uh, give them as much support as we can, because I certainly agree with you. This is a very crucial issue, and there's nothing automatic about uh, these systems functioning easily all the time. We are dealing with very complex operation systems. These are software problems. We're dealing with extraordinarily vast amounts of, of data. And it is absolutely essential that uh, these things work, and they work efficiently. And I think that there's an unending uh, process to make certain that that uh, continues. My time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Gentlemen's Chairman. time has expired. Chair recognizes the gentleman from California, Mr. Moorhead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Greenspan. In recent years, the Japanese banks have far exceeded the size of the Amer large American banks, uh, primarily because of economic conditions, I presume. Do you think that uh, the Glass-Steagall Act has had something to do with the inability of our banks to keep up in size with those in Japan? I don't think so, Mr. Moorhead. Um, basic problem that we have there is one that uh, the yen dollar exchange rate has changed dramatically and that there has been very dramatic expansion amongst the uh, Japanese banks who tend to be fewer in number, very considerably fewer in number than we have in the United States so that there's more banking activity concentrated in fewer institutions. But as I indicated uh, earlier in this session, uh, that's not an issue which concerns me, because uh, what concerns me is the ability of American banks to effectively compete abroad. And we have a number of institutions which are sufficiently large 
to do that. And in fact, it's the uh, opinion of uh, most international bankers that the most effective uh, international competitors don't happen to be the very largest banks. So I'd be more concerned about uh, one adequate capital and two adequate skills than I would be about aggregate assets. Well, in the area of ability to compete ab uh, abroad, all you have to do is to go down the street in Los Angeles, and you'll see that there's almost as seems almost as many Japanese banks as you see uh, uh, banks that have uh, American-sounding names. They seem to be competing very well. Oh, well, I have no question, but you'll also find that a lot of those very those major competitors are not the largest. Uh, banks in Japan. They have their own Glass-Steagall Act, too, do they yes, not? Yes, they do. The equivalent thereof. On, on September 30, 1987, the Wall Street Journal published an article outlining the power of German banks within that economy and their ability to control industry. What are the advantages and disadvantages of the West German system? Um, I'm not an expert on that system. I'm aware uh, of uh, what they've been doing for years. It, uh, they have a different way of adjusting to the world than we, and I would not want to give you uh, sort of an off the top of my head uh, discussion of the pros and cons. Uh, if you would like, I'd be glad to uh, do a little more thinking about it and submit it for the record, if you'd prefer. Yeah, that would be very helpful. When I do that. Does the Glass-Steagall uh, wall between investment and commercial banking make sense and allow affiliations such as those between Goldman Sachs and the Sumimoto Bank? Well, I think you're raising one of the issues that uh, we are in the process of considering. That is, there's a very extraordinary set of circumstances, competitive changes, uh, technological changes, which um, really are raising serious questions about existing banking structure. And uh, uh, that sort of issue is one of the things that we have to uh, address before making any specific types of recommendations uh, on these issues. In, in your statement, you comment on the effect of the uh, slowing of inflation on uh, in areas where the banks have made substantial loans as being something that they have uh, somewhat overcome and done relatively well concerning the, the problems that they have had. And, and yet you have had uh, situations, of course, down in Texas where it's a whole lot more than a slowing of, of inflation. You've had drastic losses in property values and other things due to the... I, I think, incidentally, Mr. Moore, I've also said declines in prices, which yeah. in those cases have really been important. Well, I, I, I see a situation in some of California's, uh, especially agriculture, where they are doing exceedingly well right now, although agriculture in the country has done as well, and where property values have gone up to four or five times what they were 10 years ago. I'm thinking orange groves. Southern California, where Florida's crop values have had a problem, uh, and where uh, California farm prices have been very high in that area. But loans have been, been made on that, uh, that property based upon the higher values than on condominiums in areas where there have been tremendous growth. Uh, isn't there a lot of danger that there may be a substantial drop in property values in both the agricultural and the condominium areas? Population it's, it's the usual practice, as far as I understand it, Congressman, that when loan officers make such loans, they're worried about precisely that same question. And in most instances, uh, they endeavor to get uh, a wedge between their perception of the potential downside market value risks and the size of the loan so that the bank is uh, effectively protected. There have been innumerable cases, as we are aware, of course, in recent years when uh, markets have gone far beyond what loan officers would have projected. It's obviously been the case in uh, the oil patch. It's clearly been the case amongst a number of our agricultural banks.
Uh, but I think in general, uh, the fact that there are these concerns and there are the, is the re recent history of these events, I think have chastened a lot of loan officers so that they are a lot more cautious. Uh, as I said earlier, um, banking is risk taking. In other words, you got to take risks if you're going to produce the type of economic values that commercial banking does. It's not an issue of uh, do you make only safe loans. As I indicated earlier, if all you made were perfectly safe loans, the value of the intermediation process to the economy would be really quite small. So we have to expect some losses. That's part of the process. The trick is to make certain that loan losses are small and, in a sense, are sufficiently small so that the safety and soundness of the bank never even remotely gets uh, touched or under consideration. So when you say, are there risks out there, there of course there were risks. And I certainly hope that loan officers who were involved in the uh, lending process are acutely aware of that. And to my knowledge, uh, if they weren't uh, 10 years ago, they most assuredly are now. My last question, I, I noticed one comment that you made earlier, that the large banks have every single advantage over the small banks, and yet people in many smaller towns like to deal with people that they know. And uh, I'm sorry, I thought I said that they didn't. The, I, I, I agree. In fact, I agree with I just what you're about to say. Well, the larger banks have some advantages. They have some, but the, they have a lot less than people believe, and in many areas, I'd say in smaller communities, I've seen large banks really butt their heads against uh, small banking institutions and were sort of bloodied and went home because there's nothing like a uh, community bank where the loan officers and the officers know the people in the community and they really have knowledge of their personal circumstances. Well, why big, bank can't, big bank can't handle that. We, we do have a lot of the bigger banks swallowing up the, the smaller banks, though. Uh, not a, yeah, we have some, sure, but not a great deal. Gentlemen's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Utah, Mr. Nielsen. Mr. Greenspan, welcome to the thank you. committee, and congratulations on your new uh, position. Well, thank great you work. very much, Congressman. Uh, recently, the Bank of America acquired Charles Schwab, the discount uh, investment broker, and then later sold it back. Uh, do you have any idea why they acquired it in the first place, and secondly, why they sold it back. Because that may be a key to whether uh, we should stop the moratorium or not. Yeah, I have some personal ideas, and I'm sure a lot of my colleagues have a lot of personal ideas, nothing that couldn't be uh, obtained from newspapers. I suggest you ask them. I, obviously, in one case, they thought it was a profitable idea. Later on, they thought not, or they thought that they would be best off without it. But I'm the, not, If uh, the banks want to remove the glass steagle in order to do accomplish the sort of thing Bank America did by yeah. acquisition, does, shouldn't this give them some pause? Well, you know, when we're talking about this whole question of Glass-Steagall, remember that what we're talking about is basically should the Congress decide to significantly alter it. We are essentially saying that commercial banks should, if they so choose, have certain types of security powers. Uh, which go beyond the type of brokerage which Charles Schwab is in, involved with. We're not saying, or should we say, that they should do that. In fact, the vast, vast majority of commercial banks will probably be far less interested in anything involved in this area than we could conceivably imagine, and that's probably good. I think what we want to do is, should it come out in the discussions of the Congress that this is a desirable thing to do, uh, that we recognize that that doesn't mean that it, uh, we would expect or even encourage uh, all banking institutions to go scurry out into the investment banking field and find a niche. I hope that won't happen. I don't expect it to happen. And, uh, uh, if it does, I'll be very surprised. You, you suggest that uh, one way to expand the bank's security activities through the bank holding companies. In other words, you're suggesting maybe we can divide them legally rather than use the Glass-Steagall approach, which divides them uh, 
as far as they're, they're concerned, uh, it breaks them back, breaks them in two part categories directly. Whereas bank holding company may break that barrier and divide them legally. Is that uh, your position? Well, no, I don't have a position, Mr. Nielsen. The suggestion you made, though. Well, uh, uh, what I said earlier uh, is the fact that uh, the Board of Governors is in the process of looking at ver all various different alternatives, including. Uh, what would happen should uh, the Congress decide to repeal Glass-Steagall or significantly alter it. Uh, I think it's much too premature to have conclusions at this stage which are thoughtful on the types of issues that you're raising. Let me ask you to speculate. What would have happened if we'd had revenue bonds as well as general obligation bonds for municipalities when the Glass-Steagall Act were, uh, was passed? Do you think they would have allowed the revenue bonds under the same basis that they allowed general obligation ba bonds at that particular time? If so, uh, if, if so, why don't we change it to allow it now? And if not, uh, uh, what's the distinction? Congressman, I really don't have a clue. I, it's, uh, it's, an interesting, it's an interesting notion. I frankly don't know what would have happened under those conditions. Okay. Since we don't want to speculate on what the people might have done in 1936, what about uh, now? The revenue bonds are in many people, many municipalities consider them just as safe as the GO bonds and don't distinguish between them. They get just as good a rate of returns on the one as the other. Uh, should we not make an exemption in, in, if we don't repeal Glass-Steagall, should we not make an exception there and allow them to go to municipal revenue bonds? I think that has got to be part of a much broader discussion which uh, this is involved in. There are. I'm not sure that I necessarily agree that, uh, that, there, there, that there are no distinctions between uh, I didn't say that. I said some, some communities okay. consider their revenue bonds just as safe as the GO bonds. Oh, well, that, are that, able to that, that, that may be true. I'm, the, the question is, uh, are they? And uh, that's a factual issue, which I'm not, a, I'm not at, uh, in a position to make a determination of. My city has told me since we re removed general revenue sharing that they're Revenue bonds are much safer than the GO bonds. It's conceivable, they, sure. Uh, no, I, uh, I don't deny that they, you can go to both sides of that issue, but that's, it doesn't automatically, uh, without looking at the evidence, I'm not sure we can make a judgment on that. One last question, Mr. Chairman. Um, you talked in, the, in response to Representative Siner's question about the moratorium. Uh, what would happen if we extend or did not extend it? You, you would like to have it see the moratorium cease as March 1st as per the agreement. Yes, sir. Uh, what are the risks involved of extending it beyond that point? Are we being unfair to the bankers by going back on our word, number one? Number two, uh, what was presumed at the time that passed that we would take other action or not? Or was, in other words, was, some, was that based on the fact that it give us time to do something about the Glass-Steagall Act or other things? Well, I don't know if it was about the Glass-Steagall Act, but it was certainly, uh, as I understand, the purposes of the Congress was basically to sort of freeze things until Congress had a chance to look over the total structure of the banking system, which is what you're at the moment proceeding to try to do. Uh, I'm not sure whether or not it's an issue of being fair or unfair to the banks. My major concern is that it is undesirable for the economy in the sense that it builds up distortions if you keep that moratorium in place which, as far as I'm concerned, are wholly unnecessary and inflicting cost on the financial system, which strikes me as a cost without any offsetting value. But if that was based on the fact that we thought we'd get something done by March 1st, then uh, should we extend it beyond if we don't get anything done by March 1st? No, in fact, uh, if it turns out, I mean, my, f my own personal first priority is one that the Congress pass legislation by far. Should that not be done, then I would say the least worst choice is to let the moratorium lapse. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentlemen's time has expired, um, and ha so has all time for questions. Mr. Uh, Chairman, your testimony has been very helpful to the subcommittee, and we're very, very glad we've been able to have this opportunity to have an exchange of views with you today. Um, as I stated earlier, the subcommittee is still in the exploratory stages of these questions, but like you, we are mindful of how quickly the March 1st deadline is approaching. And at the end of the moratorium, um, 
one of two things will happen. Uh, therefore, we feel the need to move carefully but decisively uh, during this time frame so we can understand the consequences of uh, extending the moratorium or seeing it lapse. Your testimony has convinced me that it is important for the subcommittee to develop a fuller understanding of the implications of any structural changes that Congress should consider in making the relationship between uh, commercial and investment banking. To that end, I would ask your assistance. Uh, I know that you are still developing your own ideas in this area, but it would not be appropriate for Congress to move ahead until we have a more fulsome expression of your judgments and a more realistically predictive view of all of the consequences of our actions, even those consequences which are unintended. Therefore, in order to advance our understanding of this issue, I would ask you to have your staff prepare, as I know you are, an overall plan for appropriate regulation and supervision of financial services in the United States. We need a blueprint for the 1990s and beyond. And we may already be 10 years behind in, uh, in this game, and so as a result, time is of the essence. I would suggest to you that the core questions are, from the subcommittee's perspective, how practically can we insulate depositors' accounts from the, sec from the securities and other investment activities of banks or bank affiliates and subsidiaries? How can we preserve the safety and soundness of our nation's banks under a more fully deregulated system? How can risk be minimized so that the financial condition of a subsidiary or affiliate would not be a threat to the stability of the bank? Is there a type of structure, for example, the, uh, in, uh, for example, the holding company structure that is more conducive to safety and soundness? How will our citizens and the national interest be better served by additional product line deregulation? How will a more deregulated system enhance our international competitiveness? How delicate is the competitive balance that now exists between the banking and securities industries, and what impact will any changes you propose have on that balance? Will deregulation lead to great concentration of financial resources in banks and bank holding companies, and is such concentration desirable or undesirable? How can we prevent tie-ins and other coercive forms of merchandising of banks' products? How should the bank and its affiliates and subsidiaries be structured so as to resist the, restrict the flow of confidential information? To what extent should joint marketing of services be permitted? And is it necessary to have complete separation of offices, directors, and premises? You have raised many of these questions yourself. Um, Mr. Cooper and other members have raised questions as well. Uh, what I would like to do if possible, is to work with your staff to frame some of these uh, or all of these questions so that we can have them back. Will the chairman yield? I'll be glad to yield. Would you ask them to consider whether banks should sell mutual funds or insurance? Add that, add that to your list. I think that is a good question, and we will work with the subcommittee members uh, to uh, frame the additional questions. Um, we have tried to frame the key core questions, which we believe have to be answered. Um, our staff wants to work. Um, as cooperatively and as expeditiously with yours in ensuring that all of these questions are resolved. What we would ask is for the um, answers to these questions and the reports to Congress to be submitted by December 1st or at an earlier date, if possible. And we would ask that you do submit that report to our subcommittee so that we can uh, have an additional hearing this year. Uh, it appears that Congress will, in fact, be in session until uh, December 15th or so. And uh, we would like to have a hearing because that March 1st deadline does require our ability to, um, our, our ability to be able to fully consider uh, the important ramifications of these issues with the facts before us. Would it be possible for you, Mr. Chairman, to meet that December 1st deadline by, uh, with all these questions that we've raised? We will certainly endeavor to do so, Mr. Chairman. It would be very helpful to us. Um, and uh, we will be looking forward to that report uh, because, as you pointed out, the ramifications of not acting 
uh, could be even more uh, important than uh, acting. Um, we um, very much appreciate the honor of having you appear before us um, uh, as your first uh, testimony uh, in Congress as the, as the chairman of the, of the uh, Fed. And uh, we really do look forward to working with you in the years ahead. Uh, I think that it can be a very close cooperative working relationship because the respect on this committee for you is, uh, I hope, uh, obvious to you in, uh, in the way in which we uh, fully weigh every word that you present to us. Well, I very, appreciate, I very much appreciate those kind remarks, Mr. Uh, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, very, very much. Uh, and with that, that concludes the testimony of our, of our first witness. Uh, and let us take just a two-minute break before we move on to our second witness, the Chairman of the Securities Exchange Commission. We'll take a very brief two-minute recess. While the committee recesses, we'll also take a short break and return in a few moments. Did you know that a significant portion of C-SPAN's programming is scheduled weeks in advance? You get full details of these special events in the C-SPAN update, our weekly newspaper and program guide. If you call now, we'll...